It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, I'd like to go back to the Auditor General's report about energy. I'd just like to remind the government that the AG revealed the Liberals would be overcharging the equivalent of $12,000 for every man, woman and child in Ontario for the cost of electricity. $12,000. That's a year worth of rent in downtown Toronto. That's the cost of a young person's first car. That's a graduate student's tuition for a year. That's a semester of backpacking in Europe that would cover the average family's food for an entire year. Mr. Speaker, Order. why is it okay for the government to pick the pockets of Ontarians? Mr. Speaker, just before, and I'm very eager to answer this question, but just before I do this, maybe my last opportunity before the House rises to just wish everyone a very, very happy holiday. I hope that uh, yeah. I hope that everyone. Gallery and in the province has an opportunity in this in this time period to spend some time with family, with friends. It's not always an easy time of year for people, but I hope that everyone has the opportunity to uh, appreciate this beautiful place that that we live in. And, Mr. Speaker, on that note, the. Um, you know, I just had the opportunity with uh, members of the, uh, the opposition parties to be in Paris at the, uh, the COP21 conference on climate change, Mr. Speaker. And I have to say, and I don't know if the, uh, the opposition members had this experience, but I had people coming to me, including premiers of other uh, states in uh, Australia, right, for example, looking to us as a model for the changes that we have made. And I will come back to that. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, not to do it. again to the Premier, and since I didn't get the question answered the first time, I'll try the second time. The AG said the government could have achieved all the renewable goals and not overcharged $9.2 billion. So my question very directly is, the government's overcharging of electricity will cost an average family $32,000. That's a down payment uh, on your first home in my riding in Simcoe North. That's a new Dodge Caravan. That's a 24-foot pontoon boat. It's a complete kitchen renovation. Mr. Speaker, how can this government knowingly take opportunities away from families by Order. overcharging them on energy? So the question is, how do you justify this unprecedented overcharging of energy in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, again, I say to the, uh, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, the changes that we have made in Ontario including the shutdown of the coal-fired plants, Mr. Speaker, the investment in renewable energy, Mr. Speaker, the avoidance of pollution, Mr. Speaker, that has saved lives in terms of asthma, Mr. Speaker, and costs, Mr. Speaker. Those are, those are initiatives that other jurisdictions are looking to us, Mr. Speaker. They are looking to us. They are very, very, they were very happy, Mr. Speaker, to see us there. For example, uh, Manitoba, Quebec, Ontario signing a memory understanding on cap and trade, Mr. Speaker. They are looking to us. They are asking us how we did it, Mr. Speaker. How the, in terms of the shutdown of the coal-fired plants, the avoidance of those health care costs, Mr. Speaker, we are leading the way. We will continue to do that, whether or not the leader of the opposition is with us, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again for the Premier, it is the Christmas season. Parents, grandparents and guardians have been saving all year to put an extra parent present under the tree. This government could have made that a little bit easier if they hadn't overcharged $32,000 for every family in Ontario. That could have bought 65 Order. iPads to wrap. That could have bought 80 Xbox Ones to put under the tree. That could have bought 248 kids a new supercycle to ride. Mr. Speaker, just picture those gifts. Picture the look on a kid's face as they see those gifts under the tree. I, uh, I took the approach of trying to ask for order only, but if I'm getting the signaling from you that it's not good enough, I'll ramp it up. I wish I didn't have to. So when I ask for order, please give it. And don't start right after I ask for order. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, in the spirit of Christmas, will you give Ontario one important Christmas Question. gift? Never again will you intervene in the energy sector. Will you give us that present? Never again will we have Liberals intervene and cost Ontario Thank you. more. Will you do it for Santa? You see it, please? You see it, please? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as the leader of the op oh, sorry. Please finish. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as the leader of the opposition measures the world in terms of the cost of Xboxes, let me just talk about the, some costs that uh, that I think are critical, Mr. Speaker. Tim Gray of Environmental Defence says this. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. Do you? <laughs> Finish, please. Ontario's renewable energy program was instrumental in the coal phase-out, which was justified because the coal plants were, an estimated, were estimated to cost $4.4 billion in health and environmental costs. Minister of Agriculture, come to order. The member from Dufferin Caledon, come to order. Finish, please. Five billion dollars in extra costs over 20 years to avoid 4.4 billion per year sounds like good value to me. Of course, there is also the tiny bonus of clear, clear blue skies Leeds, and small summers, Mr. Answer. Speaker. That is the cost that we have avoided, Mr. That's Speaker, right. and the health cost of those children who have, have not been admitted to hospital, Mr. Speaker. That's how I will measure success. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, your signaling is telling me that you need to be warned. And if I have to get that today, I'm going to get it. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, the Liberals recently were chiding the third party leader for not having questions on climate change. Well, to the Premier, it's difficult to criticize a climate change plan that has no details, that hasn't been released to the public. The Premier's idea of fighting climate change is photo op environmentalism and press release politics. The reality is it was the two previous Premiers of Ontario that closed the coal-fired power plants, not this Minister Premier. of Energy. I've asked for details about this government's climate change plan. They wouldn't give us any. The government has sat on their cap-and-trade plan since 2009. If she has a plan, if she has a strategy, what is it? Mr. Speaker, in all, seri all seriousness, will the Premier tell us, will tell the Legislature Remember what will show the march to Queen's Park? Details on her climate change Next plan question. or the Loch Ness Monster or the Pokeroo? What will show up first? Yeah. Thank you, Premier. He still is watching. He still watches Poker Root. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know, I know that the leader of the opposition understands how important it is that all of the coal-fired plants have been shut down, and that we have passed legislation, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they will not be rebuilt. There will not be coal-fired uh, generation of electricity uh, in Ontario again, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure that the leader of the opposition knows that investing $20 million in charging stations for electric vehicles, Mr. Speaker, is a very important. In the province, if there's going to be uptake, that infrastructure has to be in place. I know that the leader of the opposition understands that the cap and trade system that is being developed, Mr. Speaker, is being developed in conjunction. Member from Leeds Grenville, second time. And now, if it's going to get ramped up, I'm going to warnings. So that means I'm not waiting. A warning next time you're out. Carry on. That is being developed in conjunction with Quebec and with California, and that we signed a memorandum of understanding with Manitoba while we were in Paris. Mr. Speaker. So Central Canada is on the same track. Mr. Speaker, the plan is in place, and the leader of the you. opposition knows it. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I would have hoped in that response we would have had some details finally, but unfortunately not. It's awfully easy to stage photo ops and claim you will fight climate change. It's easy to set greenhouse gas reduction targets for 2030 or 2050, but it takes to 
actual work, actual details to make a difference now. The environmental commissioner, your environmental commissioner, has told us that you won't reach your 2020 targets, not even close. In fact, during this Premier's first year in office, greenhouse gas emissions actually rose 171 megatons. Wow. The Premier is more concerned about a green backdrop than dropping emissions. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier give a single example of what she has done as her, as, as, during her time as Premier, not previous Question. Premier? Other than signing agreements, attending conferences, it's all lip service. Will the Premier tell the House what she is Thank going you. to do, what the details of your plan? Please. Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, this, this from a member of a, a government in Ottawa for nine years, Mr. Speaker, which, which the record of that government was so dismal on this file, Mr. Speaker, that the current Prime Minister, when he was in Paris, Mr. Speaker, and said Canada is back, the room cheered, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. We have set clear targets. We have set an 80 per cent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions against 1990 levels by 2050. He, might not, he may not like the fact that the design features of our cap-and-trade system are uh, being developed. Mr. Speaker, we're working with California and Quebec. He may not like that we're investing yes, in infrastructure for electric vehicles, Mr. Speaker, but that's what we're doing because we are going to continue to Thank lead against, in the fight against climate change. Please. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, it just appears to be more hot air. You will ultimately be judged on your Minister of Aboriginal Affairs is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, you will ultimately be judged on your greenhouse gas emissions. And it's easy to blame previous Prime Ministers and previous Premiers. You will be judged on your actions alone. And the Premier loves to talk about climate change and fighting climate change, but it has been just that, just talk. We all know you just got back from Paris. I think it's great that you went to represent our province. I would never say you shouldn't attend. In fact, our own critic went as well. But if you want to talk about a carbon footprint, the Premier, the premier flew back and forth twice. You took 22 advisors with you on that trip. That just seems excessive. Actually, it's difficult to get one side when the other side continues. Wrap up, please. So I ask again, other than photo ops, press conferences and press releases, what has this Premier done to fight climate change? I don't want to hear about your predecessors. Your only announcement in Paris was about Manitoba. What has this Thank Premier you. done to fight climate change in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, here's what, here's what the leader of the uh, opposition needs to know. I walked into a concert in. Uh... The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Carry on. Back from Paris yesterday afternoon, and I walked into a concert in my uh, one of the schools in my riding in the evening. And the first person who spoke to me was a, a young girl from grade five. Her name is Sloane, and she came up to me and she said, "I wrote a letter to you. I just wrote a letter to you, and I, I, I want to talk to you." And her question, Mr. Speaker, was about climate change. So here's a child in grade five talking to the Premier of the province, saying to me, what are you doing? And, Mr. Speaker, my answer to her was exactly the same as it is to the Leader of the Opposition. We are doing everything we can. We are challenging industry. We have shut down the answer. coal fired plants. We are developing a plan, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we continue to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, and we're developing technology to help Thank other you. countries, Mr. Speaker. We're taking a leadership. Thank you. Please. New question, the Leader of the op uh, Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. I want to uh, begin by uh, wishing the best of the holiday season to Ontarians on behalf of New Democrats and uh, to encourage people who are. To encourage, um, 
encourage Ontarians to, uh, to reach out a helping hand to those who are less fortunate, particularly the Syrian refugees who are arriving uh, into our province today. To my question, Speaker, in November, my question is to the Premier. Uh, in November, I raised the fact that public hydro agencies in the provinces of Quebec and Manitoba are investing more in conservation uh, than here in Ontario. Well, Nova Scotia's privatized hydro agency is actually fighting against conservation, Speaker. When the Premier is in, was in Paris, did she explain why she's selling off Hydro One and giving away one of the most important tools in the fight Question. against climate change? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, one of the conversations that was very, very front of mind in Paris was the investment in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. There was a lot of conversation about the need to invest in public transportation, Mr. Speaker. And so, quite to the contrary, um, people wanted to know how we were moving ahead to make that investment. And the leader of the third party knows that in order to make that investment, we need funds, we need uh, money to be able to do that, Mr. Speaker. And that is the motivator for the broadening of the ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. So, in fact, I had many conversations in uh, Paris about how we are moving ahead, how we are making the largest investment in uh, infrastructure across the province in that province's history, Mr. Speaker, and a large part of that is transit and transportation infrastructure. That's what people in Paris Answer. are talking about. Thank Mr. Speaker. You. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier travelled to Paris to talk about fighting climate change. Hydro One will be, should be, one of the keys to energy conservation in this province. As a private company, though, Hydro One will make money when they sell more electricity, Speaker. But it is in the interest of our planet to use less electricity. I'm sure the Premier can see the contradiction here, Speaker. Can she explain why she is handing away control of Hydro One? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think what's critical is that we have a clean, renewable um, generation in this province, and that is that is what we've got, Mr. Speaker. And we we know that having that uh, generation, having companies that are uh, efficient, Mr. Speaker, and are competitive, that that is that is uh, a good thing for the province. We know, Mr. Speaker, that Hydro One can be improved. And though I, I've said that the motivation for broadening the ownership of Hydro One is the investment in infrastructure, which it is, we will all also see, Mr. Speaker, an improved company as a result of, uh, of this change. So that's a benefit, Mr. Speaker. It's a benefit to the people of the province. It's a benefit to the people who get their service from Hydro One. So we will continue. As I said, there was a lot of conversation about the Answer. importance of having infrastructure investment that's sustainable. That is the work that we're doing as a result of broadening the ownership of Hydro One. Thank you. Speaker, Ontario families want to see investment in transit and transportation infrastructure that will help make our economy greener. Transit takes cars off the road, but selling hydro doesn't build transit, according to the FAO and, in fact, according to the Minister of Finance in his own uh, economic, uh, fall economic update. So, on the one hand, selling Hydro One hobbles our ability to conserve energy and tackle climate change, and on the other hand, it actually fails to build transit. Transit speaker. I thought the Premier was serious about climate change. So why is she moving Ontario backwards, Speaker? Thank you. The premise of the leader of the third party's question is just not accurate. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, a cap and trade system, the shutdown of coal fired plants, the introduction of infrastructure for electric vehicles, the investment in sustainable infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, all those things are going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have set firm targets. We have met our 2014 target, Mr. Speaker, and we are working with our partners across the country to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario and across the country. So, Mr. Speaker, I understand that the leader of the third party is not going to support the investment in infrastructure that we're making. I think that's wrong-headed, Mr. Speaker. I think that she should be supporting that. But the reality is, we are going to continue on this path because we know that there is an environmental and there is an economic imperative yes, to making those investments. Uh, you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question? The leader of the third party. My next question is also for the Premier. In less than a month, 
hydro bills will be going up another 10 percent, and that's because the government is eliminating the clean energy benefit. And the government's plan, Speaker, for low-income Ontarians seems to uh, have a, a bit of a short circuit. What is this Premier going to do to make sure that people struggling to pay their hydro bills actually get the relief that they've been promised by her government? Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, the, um, the OESP, the Ontario Energy Support Program, um, is designed exactly to do. Is the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. I guess you didn't hear me. Carry on. Uh, the member who was heckling thinks that low-income Ontarians shouldn't know about the program, but we actually think low-income Ontarians should know about the program, Mr. Right. Speaker. And it is designed it is designed exactly to address the challenges that the leader of the third party has identified, Mr. Speaker. And we are we are going to make sure that people get that information. There's been uh, there have been flyers that have gone in electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that we are going yes, to sir. redouble our efforts to make sure that people get the information so that they can apply for those uh, yeah. programs. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Percent of low-income Ontarians have applied for the OESP. Once they have applied, it takes six to eight weeks wow. to be approved. Even if every single person applied by the end of the day today, they wouldn't get approved till sometime in February, Speaker. Supporting our most vulnerable neighbours is something people expect the government to get right. But yet again, here we have the Liberals making yet another mess in the energy sector. What will this Premier do, Speaker, for the hundreds of thousands of Ontarians who have been promised support but won't be getting it during the coldest months of the year? Sure, you know, I, I just want to say to the leader of the third party that I, I was concerned about the, uh, the outreach to low-income Ontarians, and I have said to my, uh, I've said to my staff that I want to make sure that uh, local distribution companies do uh, an extra effort to connect with low-income Ontarians to make sure that they make the application. Because, Mr. Speaker, that funding is earmarked for those people. That money is earmarked for low-income Ontarians who may be struggling to make ends meet, Mr. Speaker. We will make sure that they get that money, Mr. Speaker, and we will do everything we can to make sure that that happens within the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the holidays are around the corner. Selling Hydro One is a big gift to the Premier's friends, and she's giving Ontarians a lump of coal. People are going to pay more, Speaker, and they have their Liberal government to blame. Speaker, how did this Premier so quickly lose sight of what matters to the people of this province? Thank you, Premier. Speaker, the leader of the third party knows that she's trying to connect things that are not connected. So the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that there is a new program in place, the Ontario Energy Support Program, Mr. Speaker. At the same time that the debt retirement charge is coming off bills, Mr. Speaker, we are putting in place a program that will support low-income Ontarians. The, pro the, the broadening of the ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, is an unrelated issue. It is an issue because we are uh, investing in infrastructure. We are broadening the ownership of Hydro One. The leader of the third party knows that, and she's desperate to make a connection, Mr. Speaker, a connection that is not there. We will continue. We will continue to invest in infrastructure because we know that our competitiveness as a province relies on those investments, Mr. Speaker. The member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. New question: The member from Chatham Kent Essex. Uh, speakers, uh, speaker, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. <clears throat> Minister, you know about the fire this past weekend at Toronto South. Several correction officers and staff were taken to hospital and treated for smoke inhalation. Well, we just learned that there was a fire at Toronto East Detention Centre back on November 27th, resulting in 12 staff, including six COs and six RNs, being uh, taken for uh, smoke inhalation, and an additional three inmates were also taken to hospital. As was the case, several safety and security breaches occurred, and it would appear as though staff were muzzled once again. Shame. Staff and inmate assaults, suicides and disturbances are occurring more frequently. Minister, you need to start listening to the issues these officers are bringing forward. Minister, actions speak louder than words. Demonstrate the respect that they deserve before an officer is seriously hurt or, God forbid, killed. Their lives are placed in danger 
daily. And they watch even the worst of the worst Question. offenders. They play an integral part in the rehab. So, Speaker, to the minister, when will you start listening and act upon their recommendations and fix this crisis in correction? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And Speaker, let me first uh, start by recognizing uh, many of our hardworking corrections, uh, probation, and parole officers who are here today. Speaker, uh, the member is right. They work in uh, they work in uh, in a very difficult uh, environment, and they work very hard every single day to keep our communities safe. I think, Speaker, one of the things that I've been doing in my capacity as the minister has been, has been talking to a lot of people, including our correctional officers, as to how do we build a better system of corrections. And one thing, Speaker, I've heard again and again, including from our correctional system uh, officers, that the status quo is not good. We need to transform our system, Speaker. And, Speaker, the very first step in that transformation is hiring more new correctional officers. And, Speaker, that is why we have been we're working hard on that front. Over the last two years alone, Speaker, we have hired 571 new correctional officers. But, Speaker, we are not stopping there. We will continue to hire even more correctional officers in months and years to come and make sure that they get the intensive, proper training in order to keep our community safe. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, Minister, if you respect them, stop endangering them. Yep. We learned this morning that correction staff rejected your tentative agreement, citing a 67 per cent no vote. So it's back to the table. <laughs> Detention centers are overcrowded and understaffed. Caseloads for our probation and parole officers are huge, and there are instances where these officers are met by probation and parolees carrying weapons. Where are the safety measures to protect our officers? The Minister of Labor Disruption means putting management, even inmates, at risk at our detention centers. Communities would be put at risk where detention centers are, and I'm told by very reliable sources that a strike could also mean a huge setback of months or even years for all the work that probation and parole officers are currently doing Question. for their clients since there be no accountability. Minister, we know your ministry has been preparing for a labor dispute. What steps have you taken in the event of a labor disruption to ensure the safety of all? And when I say thank you, it's over. Minister. Well, Speaker, uh, you know, we will continue to uh, work with our correctional staff and all our partners to make sure that our. Uh, our the member from Windsor West is warned. Carry on. Speaker, that our, our, our jails are, are safe and our uh, correctional officers in particular, uh, they are safe at all times. Speaker, what ironic is that from the member opposite, uh, of all the questions he's asked, I've heard of no plan around transformation. How would he propose that we change the status quo, in fact, uh, Speaker? Order. I'm. Uh, I'm seeking cooperation from everybody, and we are on the warning system. Finish, please. Uh, speaker, you know he serves under the leader who who actually supported the dumb on crime policies by the Harper Conservatives that resulted in the kind of overcrowding that we see in our jails, and Speaker. And not to mention, just in October of 2012, the member opposite had issued a press release Thank asking you. for wage freeze increase for our, our local union members. Thank you. New question, the member from Oshawa. Right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, my question will be to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. And I'm pleased to be able to ask these questions today with a full House of Corrections officers and another few hundred outside this room. So maybe today we'll get some real answers. Speaker, correctional officers and probation and parole officers across this province soundly rejected a contract with this Liberal government. The fact that there is no deal puts this province one step closer to a strike or lockout in our jails. I asked the acting premier about this earlier this week and received an impressive non-answer. So I'll try the minister instead. Speaker, we know that while jails stay chronically overcrowded and clearly dangerous, the province has built or kept aside bed space for managers in the event of a strike or lockout. Shame. The last time there was a lockout, the government, a conservative government, used, what ma used managers from other ministries and departments to staff the jails. 
What's the plan, Speaker, in light of the hostage-taking and crisis in Thunder Bay, the fires sure. in Toronto South, floods, lockdowns, assaults, malfunctioning cell locks, breaking glass, riots and overdoses, does the Premier really want unqualified managers from various ministries like finance, the Thank environment, you. or the Treasury Board running? Thank you. Minister Kennedy, safety and personal services. Uh, well, Speaker, uh, first of all, I mean we're disappointed that the the tentative agreement that was negotiated between uh, the Treasury Board um, and the uh, OPSU Correctional Bargaining Unit was not approved by the member. It's a democratic process, and we respect that, uh, uh, Speaker. Of course, uh, we as a government remain uh, remain uh, committed uh, to bargaining and look forward to uh, determining uh, the next steps. As I was, uh, Speaker, uh, saying earlier, though, what our focus needs to be is to ensure that we transform our correctional service. Services. We need to really move away, Speaker, uh, from a model of warehousing. That's what my, our correctional officers continue to tell me. But uh, a system that is really focuses on corrections, that really focuses on rehabilitation and reintegration uh, of inmates. What we need to do, Speaker, is to break the cycle of reoffense. Uh, so, Speaker, we as a government are not interested in dealing with capacity issues and serving more jails. In fact, Speaker, we want to reduce the demand of jails in order to deal with the issue around uh, capacity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. So, Monday night in Thunder Bay was a terrible night, as we've talked about. And again, I'm pleased to welcome Mike Lundy, the president um, from that from Thunder Bay Jail, and his team went through one heck of a night on Monday. Speaker, the correctional officer that was taken hostage at the Thunder Bay Jail underwent a traumatizing experience none of us could imagine. What he couldn't imagine was getting to see his family again. Though he is physically safe now, the incident will undoubtedly have a lasting impact on the officer, his family, and his colleagues. Speaker, over the past two days, or three days, $23,000 in counting has been raised for the officer and his family through a crowdfunding campaign. This will only scratch the surface of the support that, all, that this affected officer will require. I think it says a lot about. I think it says a lot that Ontarians are raising money to support a frontline officer in his time of need. I also think it says a lot about the lack of public faith in the support that he and others in need can expect from this government. Speaker, will the minister commit to working with the Minister of Labour to ensure that correctional officers receive the respect and post-traumatic stress supports they deserve? Thank you. Be it, please. Be it, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, let me address the issue on Thunder Bay. It was a very dangerous uh, situation, uh, and I want to thank again our very professional correctional officers and all staff, uh, along with the Thunder Bay Police, who worked extremely hard uh, to defuse that, that situation uh, uh, in a very professional way. I had the opportunity, Speaker, uh, to speak with the, with the correctional officer in, in question and have given him assurance that all supports will be there for him so he gets healthy sooner. I also had the opportunity to speak with the superintendent and the local president, Mr. Michael Lundy, who's here with us uh, today, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, uh, I, I've said this before, our correctional officers do, and our probation and parole officers as well, do dangerous work. And uh, I'm working very closely with uh, the Minister of Labor to ensure that uh, all the work that he's doing around PTSD and around prevention and, and, and resiliency as, uh, as it relates to our first yes, responders, sir. that our correctional officers are part of that conversation. Thank you. Question, the member from Burlington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for Francophone affairs. The year 2015 has been a historic year for our province because it marked the uh, 400th year of francophone presence in Ontario. Could the minister please update us on the celebrations that took place this year? Thank you, the minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the minister, or rather the um, member for Burlington, for this really important question. Yes, what a year it has been, 400 years of francophone presence in Ontario. There was uh, a budget allocated to us of $9.5 million, and a lot of activities have been organized for celebrations in a lot of communities across the province, and the whole province was able to take part in Rendezvous Champlain, Penetang, Franco Fête in Toronto, and a lot of other cultural and touristic celebrations, like in Thunder Bay, Sudbury, and Windsor, for example. We also invested in a lot of funds for 
Francophone heritage, and I will tell you a lot more about it in the complimentary. Supplementary. My question, Mr. Speaker, is still to the minister responsible for Francophone affairs, and I would like to thank her for her answer. So we are very, very proud that the province recognized the contribution of First Nations in the history of Francophones. So could the minister update us on the heritage of those celebrations for future generations, the minister? Yes, the um, heritage initiatives are in the following. We have $4 million that were invested in Park in Penetang, which is the place where Champlain met with the Huron Wendat. And there is also a very important initiative, Le Rêve de Champlain, which led to the creation of a, an important series, television series, and a lot of people have already seen it and really loved it, and I invite you to watch it as well. We also invested in a franco ontarian museum online. And Mr. Speaker, there will be other announcements made later. But as an attorney general, I would like to say that in the holiday season, I am asking people to be very prudent, very careful, and not to drink and drive. So we would really like all the province to be safe in this holiday season. Thank you. Merry Christmas, Speaker, to you and all of my colleagues. My question is to the government house leader. I'm joined today by Kathleen and Gordon Stringer. Excuse me. There will be no interruption from the gallery, please. Thank you. Please finish. I'm joined today by Kathleen and Gordon Stringer, my constituents from Ottawa. They're here to support a tripartite bill that bears their daughter Rowan's name. This law would make Ontario the first jurisdiction in Canada to put in place a law around concussion identification, treatment and awareness. It is based on 49 recommendations from a lengthy and emotional coroner's inquest into Rowan Stringer's death. Rowan's law has enjoyed massive support from Ontario, across Canada, and in other parts of the world, with the federal government calling for a federal law that would emulate this bill. And just moments ago, Brains Worldwide International, based out of Austin, Texas, called for the passage of this bill. What assurance will the government House Leader give my constituents that this Liberal, NDP and Conservative bill will be called immediately for committee and Thank third you. reading so Rowan's law will be in Thank you. Stop, stop, you see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Government House Leader. Your House Leader. Minister of Education, Speaker. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And, and obviously, our thoughts and our prayers go uh, with the Stringer family and uh, with, uh, with uh, all Rowan's friends, because I know this has had a big impact on, on the friends and teammates that, uh, that Rowan uh, played with. Uh, we actually, obviously, at the Ministry of Education and other ministries that have been affected, are, are reviewing the coroner's um, recommendations and will, of course, respond directly uh, to the office of the chief coroner. But I want to thank the member and my, my colleagues, uh, the minister from Ottawa, so the member from Ottawa South, and the member from Kitchener Waterloo, is that right? So, all three party uh, sponsorship um, and obviously Answer. the member here. The government will be supporting this bill. We believe that this is a good bill. Thank you. The uh, structure that has been set. Thank you. Supplementary. I'd like to thank the Minister of Education for acknowledging her government's support, but the question actually is a process question to the government house leader. Rowan's in Rowan Springer's inquest took place over several weeks, with many expert witnesses forming the basis of those 49 recommendations. Many of those experts are here with us today, including Lisa Fisher, Charles Tater, and Michael Sharp, some of North America's leading concussion experts from right here in the province of Ontario. Other groups, like Coaches Canada, Parachute Canada, the Ontario Athletic Therapist Association, 
Association and Rugby Canada are here today to see this bill through. Given a previous concussion bill, 39 died on the floor of the order paper, and given the inquest was both lengthy and substantive, the stringers and our stakeholders reasonably expect that this bill would pass expeditiously so the committee, which will be led by the Minister of Tourism, Sport and Culture, can get moving. So Question. I go back to the Minister of the, of the House. At the very least, can you assure the Stringer family today that Rowan's law will indeed pass Thank the you. Legislative Assembly of Ontario? Thank you. Uh, say, thank you, and and you know I do want to update the House on what has happened. Um, since the uh, since uh, this came up as an issue, uh, we have actually required all the school boards in the province to have a concussion law. The Ontario Physical and Health Association of FIA has updated uh, their concussion. Uh, rules within the uh, what's known as the Ontario Physical Education Safety Guidelines. That's a living document, and as a result of the coroner's inquest and of the um, and of the uh, work that AFIA has done and the experts that are here today, we look forward as this uh, bill moves forward, the Answer. advisory committee is set up to continuing to update those guidelines because we. Really Realize that there's more research, new research, and as that new research becomes Thank available, you. we know we need to continue. Thank you. Your question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Auditor General found that the delays and cost overruns in bringing CPIN online for children's aid societies are being shouldered by the societies themselves and come out of their general operating budgets. That means less money to provide protection to children in care and more opportunities for them to fall through the cracks. A coroner's inquest into the death of Jeffrey Baldwin called for a CPIN to be implemented in February of 2014 because Jeffrey fell through those cracks. Speaker, how does the minister explain how her government went from a commitment to implement CPIN program in 47 children's aids at a cost of $150 million in January of 2016 to now saying the cost will be as much as $200 million and won't be fully implemented until 2020? Question. Thank you. Children Youth Services. Mr. Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank my critic for the question on CPIN. And as she knows, this was asked by the official opposition yesterday as well. And I first want to say again to this House that my ministry is acting on all the recommendations from the Auditor General, and we won't be stopping there, Speaker. I talked about our action plan going forward in the House. And when it comes to CPIN, uh, Speaker, this is a very important system. This essentially brings together 47 disparate IT systems into one child protection information network and already we have 20 percent of the cases on file and I expect 30 percent of the cases to be on file by the spring. We're investing heavily in this system because it's about the protection and safety of our most vulnerable children and care speaker. We already have 17 million child welfare files uh, yes, on the system and we will continue to support our frontline workers in making this an effective system for our children. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, what the minister doesn't seem to realize is that bringing this money out of the budgets of the operating budgets of children's aids is actually putting children at risk. Uh, with CPIN aren't just what the Auditor General identified. We know that pro the province's First Nations child welfare agencies, who are responsible for a large percentage of the province's wards, don't feel that they've been consulted on CPIN. Yet this government committed to consult with First Nations child welfare providers and communities to reform the system by 2015. Speaker, where is the urgency to reform the children's aid system in this province? How many Jeffrey Ball Baldwin's and Caitlin Sampson's does there have to be? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, the reason I'm committed to seeing CPIN uh, come to fruition is because of the safety and protection of children here, in care. Here. The reason I am committed to this is because I don't want more tragedies in our child welfare system. Here, here, here. And, Speaker, it's very important that we get this right. The system here, here. must be perfectly correct as we go forward. We've had good progress. 
we'll have more uh, going forward. I've met with the frontline workers who are working on CPIN, and it is a big change process, yeah. Speaker. And we are continuing to invest in more support, training, and communications. And I listen to the frontline workers. I listen to the leadership of uh, Children's Aid. In fact, on Monday, I'm meeting with the leadership of Tw uh, Child Welfare Agency Answer. and the association so we can talk about the Auditor General's recommendations and how they're feeling about CPEC. Thank, thank, thank you. Your question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Last week, I hosted one of the culture talk sessions in my riding of Trinity Spadina as you. part of the consultation process for Ontario's first culture strategy. It was very well attended, Mr. Speaker. In attendance were representatives from artists, um, arts organizations, artists, art patrons, and other constituents. My local BIA were, were represented, the Daniel Festival was represented, the Chinatown Festival was represented, and the, uh, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra and the Design Exchange were, were, were represented as well. Here, here. It was a fantastic gathering. Phil uh, was energy, excitement, and deep conversation. Our discussion highlights some of the things our government has done well and illustrated some of the next steps and opportunities. Speaker, through you to the minister. Now that the culture talk consultation are complete, can you provide us with Question. some more details about this initiative? Here, here. Thank you, Minister of Tourism, Culture, Sport. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm uh, happy uh, to respond to the member's question and thank him for his continued advocacy for arts and culture here in the province of Ontario. No Mr. Speaker, this is the first time a government's gone out and asked people what do they think about culture to build a uh, provincial-wide strategy. And we know things are changing in culture, Mr. Speaker, with technology, and we've seen a lot of new art forms come forward. And this is a sector that can contributes $22 billion to our economy and uh, employs over 280,000 people. So what we did, Mr. Speaker, we went out there, we spoke to people in 11 different uh, parts of Ontario. Uh, we had uh, smaller meetings with uh, Indigenous uh, 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 First Nation groups. Uh, we spoke to young people. And what we did was we had these conversations. And I want to thank members from all sides of the House, because I know there are members uh, on the other side who had their own consultations, like the members from Lead uh, Grenville and obviously uh, the member from uh, Trinity Spadina. But we got a lot of Answer. positive information, and it's about building on the success that we have in Ontario and continuing to build our economy up through uh, a strong uh, culture you. sector, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the minister for the, for the good work he does in his ministry. I'm proud of the investment our government continues to make in the uh, arts and culture sector. The arts has a profound effect on our lives. For seniors, participating in arts can lead to better health and well-being. Researchers have indicated that presence of artists and art organizations reduce neighborhood crime and delinquency. For children, the use Participating arts can lead to better social skills, better grades in school, and lower dropout rates. Cultural organizations build communities, identity, and pride, and lead to increased tolerance, free expression, and diversity. Arts and culture strengthen the economy, attracting people to living, visit, and spend money in our communities. Speaker, can the minister uh, provide us with an uh, indication of our government's next step uh, on, on this initiative? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Speaker. So we had these great conversations. We had over 1,000 people participate in person. We had over 800 submissions uh, from online submissions, written submissions, um, uh, submissions coming in uh, directly to the website. And, Mr. Speaker, what we're going to do is we're going to take all of that information, we're going to uh, collect it, we're going to uh, analyze it and come forward with a framework for the strategy, bring it back to Ontarians, get some more feedback, and we hope uh, by uh, the end of uh, the next, uh, by the end of June of next year, we will have the first ever culture strategy here in the province of Ontario that reflects what Ontarians want. Uh, this is about making sure that our government uh, resources are aligned with what people want, and we can work towards building our economy. But even more importantly, Mr. Speaker, continue to build great culture that tells our story here in the province of Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Simcoe. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question uh, is to the uh, Minister of uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this government and the Ontario Fire Marshal created a risk-based assessment tool for communities to use when evaluating fire services. Unfortunately, they created a tool that doesn't work. This is partly because they forgot to consult firefighters, the people who actually understand what is needed to keep communities safe. The assessment tool should be able to tell a community the level of service, fire service, they need to get the job done. Instead, the tool doesn't say anything. 
It produces a number, not on a scale or on a grid, just a number that means nothing. The vagueness of the tool puts public safety at risk. So, Mr. Speaker, I suggest the solution is simple. Will this government put a hold on the use of the current tool, consult firefighters, Question. and develop a tool that will keep communities safe? Yep. Minister of Community and Safety and Personal Services. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. First of all, Speaker, I think the member opposite recognizes that uh, fire safety is a, is, a, uh, is a very important responsibility that we take very seriously. The Office of the Fire Marshal, uh, under, the, uh, under the provincial legislation around Fire Protection and Prevention Act, uh, uh, exercises uh, his authority to ensure that we have appropriate services available across the province. On this particular issue around, around risk-based assessment tool, Speaker, um, um, I, my understanding is that the tool was, uh, was created with, with consultation, but I have had, of course, conversations with uh, professional firefighters as well and their concerns, and I have committed uh, to them that I will work with them to there ensure that uh, that assessment tool is, uh, is uh, re reflective of the reality and ensures that our communities, Answer. our homes, our businesses are safe at all times. Thank you. Hey, hey. Supplementary. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the minister. Sault Ste. Marie believes they can operate with 20 less firefighters, which they pan, plan to slash over the next three years. But how did they come to that number, and how do they know it won't affect public safety? Common sense would tell me that 20 less firefighters means community safety is being put at risk. But this government, Mr. Speaker, refuses to create a proper risk-based assessment tool to guide municipalities in their decision-making. Communities are left to speculate if they have enough firefighters or they're forced to spend thousands of dollars on consultants to find the answer. Mr. Speaker, why is this government afraid to offer a proper risk-based assessment tool, one that will actually help to ensure there are enough firefighters to ensure community safety? Minister. Well, Speaker, I'm not going to start judging a decision of, of an elected, uh, uh, elected body like the uh, Sault uh, Ste. Marie uh, Council. It's, it's their decision. Uh, of course, we require that, uh, that fire safety, as required under the legislation, remains paramount. I also want to thank uh, Speaker, the member for Sault Ste. Marie, who has also spoken to me uh, about this, uh, this matter before, and I thank him for his advocacy and urging that I look into this uh, matter carefully as well. As I mentioned earlier, I have uh, had conversations with Ontario's professional firefighters. Uh, I, have, uh, I have committed to them that I look forward to working with them. My staff has already been engaged with them uh, on this particular issue, and we, of course, will consult them and Ontario's municipalities to make sure that we have ri right tools in place. But the key speaker will remain that we need to make sure that our communities are safe at all times for fires. Our businesses depend on it. Our residents depend Thank on you. it. New question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, today, over 2,000 patients in Whitby, Oshawa, Scarborough, and across the Central East CCAC are stuck on a wait list for home care. The Liberals like to say they're committed to five-day home care, but they are forcing thousands of patients with high and moderate needs to wait an average of four months for personal support services. Speaker, this is unacceptable. There is no way that any senior in Ontario living alone and struggling to make ends meet should be forced to wait for home care that they desperately need. So why is this Premier ignoring literally thousands of patients and seniors in Whitby and across the region who need home care now but have to wait months just to get it. Thank you. The long -term care. Health, long -term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. And uh, it is unacceptable that individuals who are in serious need for support uh, need to wait uh, far too long to receive that report. That's why we're acting, Mr. Speaker. We're acting on the basis of three reports now that we've received this year. We introduced a 10-point action plan on home and community care in the spring. We're implementing 10 different recommendations to bring down those wait times. There are more than 800,000 people across this province that each and every year access home care through our CCACs. We have hard-working frontline workers who are doing as much as they can. I look forward in the coming weeks as well to uh, release a discussion paper, Mr. Speaker, that is going to speak to additional changes, including structural changes that are needed to continue to improve the service that these individuals and others like them Answer. so badly need and deserve, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's not lost, at anyone, uh, lost on anyone that the Liberals are actually waiting for the House to rise and the Christmas break to occur 
paper before they released that paper, that secret paper on home care. It's quite disappointing. <laughs> Seniors from Whitby uh, to Peterborough are waiting hundreds of days for the home care that they need. And in schools across the region, Speaker, there are over 3,000 students stuck on the wait list for occupational therapy, more than 1,800 in Whitby alone. They're being forced to wait an average of 423 days for the support that they need, and others are waiting two years for speech-language therapy. It means a child in grade one speaker might actually get the support they need by the time they get to grade three. How can this Premier think it's acceptable to force ch children and seniors in Whitby and Oshawa to wait months or even years to get the support that they need? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know and I understand the reasons why the leader of the third party is focused on Whitby right now, but we're focused on the entire province, Mr. Speaker. Our goal is to make sure that we're providing a high quality service to all Ontarians wherever they reside, whether in northern Ontario, southwestern Ontario, eastern Ontario, central Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Our obligation is the same to everybody. I look forward to discussing with members of her caucus once we release the discussion paper on home and community care to see how we might work together, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, on creating a plan that invests in these people, treats them with dignity and respect, and provides them with that service that they deserve. Thank you. Your question, the member from Davenport. Mr. So, Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. In spring of this year, our government announced that we will be investing $13.5 billion in improvements across the GO Rail network as part of the Regional Express Rail Plan. A key component of delivering on this promise is eliminating the existing Davenport Diamond, one of the busiest rail crossings in North America. I was proud to host Minister Del Duca in my riding this summer to discuss this important project and happy that he accepted, recognizing the importance of this project to my com community. But, Mr. Speaker, many of my constituents continue to express real concerns about the potential impact that any change to this crossing could have on our community. Can the minister please tell members of this House what he is doing? to ensure that the voices of my residents of Davenport are being heard and that they are getting the best project possible. Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, very happy to take this question from my friend and colleague, the member from Davenport. Uh, I know that I'll have the chance to provide a little bit more detail in the supplementary answer, Speaker. I just wanted to use this opportunity to say she is 100 percent right. She uh, organized a town hall meeting that took place uh, during the summer. Uh, that I was uh, quite honoured to attend in her community. Uh, and, Speaker, on this side of the House, there are, I think, 58 women and men who uh, serve as strong champions for their community. But I want to pay, pay tribute to all of them, but I want to pay particular tribute to the member from Davenport. This is not an easy issue to deal with. As we continue to build up the infrastructure that we need in our province, it is expensive, it is time-consuming, and it is disruptive to communities, Speaker. I know that the team at Metrolinx and at MTO will continue to work with residents in Davenport especially because of the yes, advocacy of this MPP from Davenport to make sure that we produce an outcome that's better for the region, but also better for Davenport. Thank you, thank you very much. So I want to thank the minister for his response. And from the onset of this project, I have been committed to working with residents and all levels of government to ensure that our community is heard on this issue. I will also continue to champion for modern and environmentally sound legacy pieces that properly represent our vibrant community, items which were also recommended by the residents' reference panel. Mr. Speaker, one of the things I continue to hear about from those in my community and that I'm advocating for on their behalf is the desire to have a GO station at Blur and Land down. Can the minister please provide members of this House and my community in Davenport with a status update on this station? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. And again, I thank the member from Davenport for the follow-up question and the specific request. Speaker, people in this legislature and people across Ontario have heard us say that the GO Regional Express Rail plan will increase weekly trips across our entire GO Rail network from almost the current 1,500 to uh, nearly 6,000 trips across the entire network, Speaker. I said in my original answer, in order to get this right, in order to build the province up and build the infrastructure that we need, it is disruptive. We recognize that. That's why Metrolinx and MTO are working very hard with the member from, uh, from Davenport. Speaker, not that many weeks ago, 
uh, Metrolinx identified uh, that we had narrowed a list for future potential stations across the whole network down to 50. I recognize that uh, in the spring or summer of 2016, we will con confirm the final number. Yes, sir. While I'm not in a position to confirm what might take place in Davenport, I know and everyone on this side of the House knows that that MPP from Davenport will continue to be a champion, and she'll make sure that we get it right. Thank you. Your question, the member from Leeds, Grenville. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Last week, our PC caucus, with the help of thousands of realtors, home builders, and hardworking Ontarians, slammed the door shut on this government's municipal land tax transfer tax grab. Thank Speaker, you, Steve. We fought hard to keep the home ownership dreams of young families in this province alive. But Ontarians know this Liberal government all too well. Taxes are in their DNA and have climbed a staggering $30.8 billion on their watch. Since we know Speaker a Leopard can't change its spots, nope. Ontarians are worried about what other taxes this minister has up his sleeve to pick their pockets. Yep. Speaker, is the minister considering making the family car his next target by authorizing all municipalities to collect a vehicle registration tax? Don't levy my Chevy! Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, I'd, I'd like to wish the member opposite a very Merry Christmas. <laughs> That's a very nice idea. He, uh, he deserves one, I think, yes, after this session in the House. And I want to say uh, very simply, I answered uh, that question uh, last week uh, when I talked about the dialogue we're having with our municipal partners. I want to say to the member opposite that uh, if he wants to propose that we don't allow municipalities to, to the tax chair, please. people have baby kittens, I'd be pleased to stand in my place and say we're not going to do that. <laughs> Supplementary. Don't let me my Chevy. I've heard the same lines that he used when he, I asked him about a land transfer tax scheme. Yeah. For weeks, this minister claimed I was making it up until he fessed up yep. and backed off. Yep. Speaker, drivers in Ontario already pay $10 billion every year to the provincial treasury through taxes and fees. And, the, and what's more, this government blooming carbon tax and road tolls make the commute to work an even more expensive one. Speaker, enough is enough. And just yeah. like the MLTT, the buck stops with this minister. No more jokes. I want a straight answer. Does the minister feel drivers in this province already pay enough taxes, and will he commit today that he won't let a new car tax out of the garage? I, I could do three seconds. Uh, speaker, uh, this, is, this is too rich by three quarters. Coming from a member uh, and, a, and a previous government that did everything they possibly could to debilitate our municipal sector. It's absolutely true. We downloaded $3.6 billion and when municipalities complained about it and said they were going to have a tough time making against me, they said, go raise taxes. Right. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Please. The leader of the opposition on a point of order. Speaker, point of order. I would like to correct my record during question period. I said GHG emissions rose by 171 megatons. They rose to 171 megatons during the Premier's first year in office. Thank you. That is a point of order, and all members are allowed to correct their record. Uh, let's get through these quickly, and I hope they're not uh, things that I need to get moving on because we've got two very important things to do. Member from uh, Nepean Carlton on a point of order. Appreciate it. Merry Christmas uh, again to all colleagues. I just want to introduce my daughter Victoria and her friend Shannon, who are here today to witness the legislation. Thank you. I'm, I've, I've got a few. I'm told that uh, I'm told that she's. I'm told that uh, the member's daughter challenged her to a cartwheel contest. <laughs> the uh, member from Hamilton Mountain uh, on thank a you, point Mr. of Speaker. order. Uh, I would like to, on behalf of uh, my caucus uh, member, the MP for MPP for Welland, uh, introduce Andy Roy, who is the president of the NDP Writing Association in Welland, and welcome. Thank you. 
The member from Eglinton Lawrence. Uh, point of order, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's been a lot of legislation just passed uh, and will be passed, but one important uh, change took place, and I want to thank uh, Dennis Clark, the Sergeant Arms, for facilitating it. And that is, my uh, granddaughter was thrown out of the legislature because she fell asleep on my daughter's lap. And uh, as a result of the intervention by the Sergeant Arms, uh, children can fall asleep in the legislature and not be thrown out again. Thank you. Thank you. I've had the honour this last session of. Member from Huron Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd hate to interrupt, but I've had the honour of having a University of Waterloo co-op student with me this past session. I just want to say thank you to Heather Boone. Thank you. Member from uh, Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, in, in conjunction to wishing you and the rest of the legislature a happy Christmas and uh, festive season, I want to wish my good friend and neighbour. Minister Leo, a happy birthday in a couple of days. Uh, um, my friends, uh, sad news. Uh, oh, next week. You have to come back next week. This is uh, the last day for our pages, and we want to thank them for the wonderful work that they've done. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Leeds Grenville has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing concerning a vehicle registration tax. The matter will be debated today, uh, sorry, on February 16, 2016. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 109, an act to amend various statutes with respect to employment and labour. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. On December the 9th, 2015, Mr. Flynn moved third reading of Bill 109, an act to amend various statutes with respect to employment and labour. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Nappy. Mr. Nappy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Salvanese. Mr. Salvanese. Mr. Mangat. Mr. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Cloud. Mr. Cloud. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller. Mr. Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Monsieur Bess Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. De Novo. Mr. De Novo. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. I admire Randy. Seven, the nays are 16. The ayes being 77 and the nays being 16, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 144, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend certain other statutes. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
On December 9, 2015, Mr. Bradley moved third reading of Bill 144, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend certain other statutes. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Naki. Mr. Naki. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Sandals. Sandals. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Charles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madam Lalon. Madam Lalon. Mr. Kadri. Mr. Kadri. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Miller Hamilton. East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes being 55 and the nays being 41, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, Chelsea and Lecture, Proje de Law. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. Government House Leader on a point of order. Honour awaits.
May it please your honour. The Legislative Assembly of the province has at its present meetings thereof passed certain bills to which, in the name and on behalf of the said Legislative Assembly, I respectfully request your honour's assent. The following are the titles of the bills to which your honour's assent is prayed. An Act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000 with respect to tips and other gratuities. Loi modifiant la loi de 2000 sur les normes d'emploi en ce qui concerne les pourboires et autres gratifications. An Act to reduce the abuse of fentanyl patches and other controlled substance patches. Loi visant à réduire l'abus de des timbres de fentanyl et d'autres timbres de substances désignées. An Act to amend various statutes with respect to employment and labour. Loi modifiant diverses lois en ce qui, en ce qui concerne l'emploi et les, les relations de travail. An Act to amend the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth Act 2007 with respect to notices of serious bodily harm or death. Loi modifiant la loi de 2007 sur l'intervenant provincial en faveur des enfants et des jeunes en ce qui concerne les avis de décès ou de blessures graves. An Act to amend the Mental Health Act and the Health Care Consent Act 1996. Loi visant à modifier la loi sur la santé mentale et la loi de 1996 sur le consentement aux soins de santé. An act to require research to be undertaken and programs to be developed for pregnancy loss and infant death and to proclaim October 15th as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Day. Loi exigeant des recherches et des programmes sur les pertes de grossesse et les décès néonatales et proclamant le 15 octobre Journée de sensibilisation au deuil perinatal. An act to implement budget measures and to enact or amend certain other statutes. Loi visant à mettre en œuvre les mesures budgétaires et à édicter ou à modifier d'autres lois. An act to recognize the corporate structure of the Métis Nation of Ontario by enacting the Métis Nation of Ontario Secretariat Act 2015. Loi visant à reconnaître la structure juridique de la Nation Métis de l'Ontario par l'édiction de la loi de 2015 sur le Secrétariat de la Nation Métis de l'Ontario. An Act to revive 422504 Ontario Limited. An Act to revive the Gage Research Institute. An Act to revive Zara HSLCC Incorporated. An Act to revive 1170517 Ontario Incorporated. An Act to revive Larry Blake Limited. An Act to Revive Bayview Farms and Enterprises Limited. An Act to Revive 563523 Ontario Limited. An Act to Revive 1064514 Ontario Incorporated. An Act to Revive Precision Pipe Manufacturing Incorporated. In Her Majesty's name, Her Honourable Lieutenant Governor doth assent these bills. Au nom de Sa Majesté, son honneur, la Lieutenant Governor sanctions ces projets de loi. And if I may, Mr. Speaker and Premier, may I just say to all of you in the House uh, a thank you for your public service to the end of this year and a very warm set of good wishes for health and happiness and prosperity in this House and in your homes in the year to come. Thank you so much. Just before we um, recess, uh, I offer you my personal thanks, uh, save and accept uh, for the wonderful experience I have during question period. I would, I would offer you my heartfelt uh, Merry Christmas, season's greetings, Happy New Year to you, your family, your staff here, your staff in your writings, and I want to express my gratitude, and I'm sure ours, to the entire staff here at the Legislature. Merry Christmas to everybody.
and of course our visitors. But thank you. There are no further. There are no further. Uh, there's, that's it. Well, we've already done that. There's no other further matters. This house stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.